Okay, go ahead and have them come in. Yeah, you can just have you slide over a little bit so you can kind of. Okay. Okay, good morning. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, it's been quite a week for our state and the entire country with Tuesday's election. Voting and civic engagement have always been a part of our state's DNA. But this year, Iowans took that to a whole new level. We had record turnout with more than 76% of registered vote Iowans voting, record absentee voting with more than a million people voting absentee. We're at an all-time high in the number of registered voters, nearly 2.1 million. Even in the midst of a global pandemic, we found a way to make our election happen successfully and at record levels. I'd like to take this opportunity to commend the Secretary of State Paul Pate and his team, as well as our 99 county auditors and their staff, our poll workers and volunteers for their outstanding work in planning and executing this year's election. This year, Iowans validated the direction of our state by expanding the majority in the Iowa House and maintaining the strong majority in the state Senate. This was a vote of confidence in our work to cut taxes, build a future ready Iowa, work to make sure that we have an outstanding mental health system, grow our economy while maintaining fiscal responsibility. In addition, it was a validation of our balanced response to COVID-19, one that is mindful of both public health and economic health. I'm looking forward to getting to work with the legislature next year on an agenda that keeps our state moving forward. At the, at the federal level, uh, I'm proud uh, that my good friend Joni Ernst, who uh, won one of the most hard fought and expensive Senate races in the country. And we're adding three new faces to the United States House delegation, including two more women. For the first time in our history, we have more women than men in our delegation to Congress. Both the House and the Senate, we have four women and two men serving. But now that the election is over, it's time to come together as Iowans and Americans and do the best for our state and our country. So although the outcome of the presidential election is not yet clear, it can't change our willingness to put country ahead of party and work together for the common good. So again, I just uh, thank you to uh, everyone who made this year's election happen, and that includes those of you uh, in the press corps. Uh, I appreciate all that you've done, as this has been an extremely interesting uh, year. So now let's move on to COVID-19. Over the last few weeks, Iowa has experienced a significant increase in COVID-19 cases, and we're not alone. States across the Midwest and really across the country are experiencing the same. Many states, including ours, have seen their record numbers of cases from earlier in the year surpassed during the current surge. And in almost every state, increased virus activity is resulting in rising hospitalizations. Here in Iowa, during the month of October, we reported more than 41,000 new cases of COVID-19. Our statewide positivity rate averaged 14.3% and hospitalizations increased from 393 on October, on October 1st to 676 on the 31st. And we all know that this trend cannot continue. Nine months ago, we knew very little about the virus when it first hit our state. So at that time, we took targeted mitigation steps to protect those at highest risk for serious illness and to do everything we could to uh, avoid overwhelming our healthcare systems. Those actions were necessary at the time to ensure we were prepared to effectively manage our response to COVID-19, but they never were intended to be long-term solutions. Since the beginning, we've had to balance both, as I said earlier, both lives and the livelihoods of Iowans. Today, the situation is much different and we have more options available to, to us to keep our state healthy. We've built a very strong testing program with capacity to test more than 10,000 Iowans a day. New treatments and therapies are now available that didn't even exist less than a year ago. And vaccines um, are ahead on the horizon. 
Both government solutions, but, but government solutions alone can't stop this virus. It's up to every single one of us. And there are simple things that each of us can do in our daily lives that we know will make a difference. Wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands often, stay home when you're sick, get tested, and follow your quarantine if you have the virus. And I would add, get a flu shot. And as the weather changes and more of our activities move indoors, I'm asking you to take additional precautions and carefully consider whether certain events are worth the risk that they could present for you or someone you love. We also need to be thinking about, upcom about upcoming holiday gatherings, even with our own families, and make a plan on how you can celebrate together safely and responsibly. I understand that many people are tired of living differently because of COVID-19. But in the big picture, these are really small sacrifices and they will help us manage uh, the virus while living life. But I need your help to make that happen. For the next three weeks at least, I am asking Iowans to make every effort to help us stop the spread of COVID-19. It's critical right now that we work together to protect those who are most vulnerable to serious illness and continue to do everything we can to preserve our health care resources, including the doctors and nurses who care for COVID patients. My team has been in daily contact with Iowa's health systems and hospitals over the last several weeks as virus activity and hospitalizations have been trending up. We've been discussing what they do every day. We've been discussing their surge plans, staffing challenges, and really how the state can help. And what I've heard from hospital CEOs and other leaders was encouraging and inspiring while, understand, while understanding the seriousness of COVID-19, they have assured me that they are prepared to do whatever is necessary to continue patient care in any situation, even a pandemic. It's just what they do in healthcare. And they've spoke at length, at length about the concern for their staff. The last nine months have taken a toll on all of our healthcare workers. Long hours, difficult cases and illnesses among coworkers is a daily reality when you work in a hospital or long-term care facility uh, during a time like this. So on Tuesday, working with them and in collaboration with them, uh, I approved $25 million from CARES funding to be allocated to hospitals to help address their staffing needs. Funds will be distributed based on the hospital's average census over the months of September and October. And I want to take just a moment um, to thank every healthcare employee in the state of Iowa. Whether you care for patients at the bedside or support the team that does, what you do every day is so important and so very appreciated. So thank you for continuing to show up and to care for Iowans each and every day. Caring for each other is another request that I've heard from the hospital leaders that I spoke with. They stress that while hospital capacity is stable for now, it isn't sustainable if positive cases continue to surge at this level. It's their hope that Iowans will also step up and help care for the local hospitals and their care, health care providers by doing their part to stop the spread of the virus. And I assured them that they can count on us. Today I'm pleased to have with me the chief medical officers from Unity Point Health and Mercy One Des Moines. These physician leaders are helping manage the frontline response to COVID-19 in their organizations and I've asked them to join us to help Iowans better understand how hospitals are working to ensure that the quality care continues for every patient, uh, even during a pandemic. So first, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Hino Carrion. He is the Chief Medical Op Officer at Mercy One Des Moines <clears throat> to share how hospitals and healthcare systems are adjusting their operations to, to uh, manage higher patient volume at this time. Thank you, Governor, um, for that statement. While we are experiencing significant surges in COVID-19 amidst this pandemic, it's not something new. Unfortunately, it is more severe and more critical than it was uh, in the onset. 
however as the governor has eloquently stated we are more prepared at this time to manage the not only the volume but also the acuity of illness that we're seeing kind of across our state we are working alongside not only our mercy one medical centers but also other hospitals across our state who are preparing physicians nurses advanced practice providers and ancillary staff to ensure that we can meet the needs of our community and our state we continue to work closely with our public health partners to meet our community needs and have contingency plans if additional capacity is needed we are directing our efforts with hospitals across iowa to uh, include our rural networks to ensure they have the appropriate resources and the equipment needed to manage these patients at their local facilities transferring patients impacted by severe illness or injury is normal to all our operations at each of our hospitals we are at a critical point in our state's fight against COVID-19. It's going to take every Iowan doing their part to get this virus under control. I'm asking you as an emergency department physician, as a father, and as a husband, please protect your families, our community, and our healthcare workers by wearing a mask, avoiding large gatherings, maintaining physical distancing, and using meticulous hand hygiene. If you haven't already, please obtain your flu vaccine if you are able. If you're feeling sick, have pre-existing conditions, are concerned about the pandemic, virtual services are provided across our state to attempt to keep you safe. With that being said, thank you everyone. God bless. Thank you, Dr. Carrion. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Dr. Dave Williams, who is the Chief Clinical Officer of Unity Point Health, to talk about the importance of the pandemic on the healthcare workforce and, again, what Iowans can do to help. Dr. Williams? Thank you, Governor Reynolds, and uh, thank you very much for the announcement on the CARES Act funding. It is definitely going to be useful as we try to fight this pandemic together throughout our state. You're going to hear a lot of similarities in our remarks, and I'm happy for that because fellow islands, my job is to tell you it's time we have to start listening. You know, the illness burden in our community and in our country is too high, and it's time that we really buckle down, as the governor said, and start to do something about it. So in my role as chief clinical officer at Unity Point Health, I'm in charge of the clinical enterprise throughout our system, including our hospitals, including our clinics, including our home care services. And I've been traveling throughout the state and I've really got to watch these people in action. You know, we talk about health care heroes often, and I can't stress whether you work at Unity Point or any other facility in, in this great state, the heroic actions over the past eight months. The entire system, the entire state is seeing an increase of COVID patients and I think we have to remember that that goes on with the regular illnesses. People are still having heart attacks. People are still having strokes. People still have the regular illness burden on top of that. And we're going to do a great job and take care of you. And I don't want to spread doom and gloom. Dr. Carrion and myself, the University of Iowa, systems throughout the state are collaborating like never before. We're going to have beds. We're going to take care of you. But I think my take home message, if you remember nothing else, my people, these healthcare workers throughout our state, they're exceptional. And at this point, they're exhausted. They're exhausted mentally. They're exhausted physically. They've been battling this disease for eight grueling months. And now is the time I ask for Iowa. This is the time as a state, as a community, you got to take care of my family. We've been spending eight months taking care of you, taking care of your family, taking care of your friends. My plea to everybody watching this today, take care of my family. It's time to take care of the health care workers. As Governor Reynolds says, we have to get this curve back moving in the right direction. These next three weeks are critical. I drove down here with my sunroof down today. It is beautiful. I can't believe how beautiful it is for November in Iowa. We all look at the forecast. We know what's going to happen. Dr. Carrion and I always see in the winter months an increased illness burden because we huddle inside. You know, we keep saying the same thing. You might be sick of hearing, about, hearing it, but I need you to listen. Wash your hands. Socially distance when possible. Avoid large gatherings. Get your flu shot. 
Stay home when you're sick. Get tested. You've heard the same message from all three of us. We need to listen. It's time to get this pandemic under control. I love this state. I love the people of this state more than anything else. What I love most about this state is how we band together in crisis. You saw it with the derecho. You can think of 30 other examples where the great people of Iowa band together. Let's band together. Let's get this pandemic under control. Let's save you. Let's save your family. And I want you to save my family. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I greatly appreciate the perspective you both provided today. And I wanna again thank you and your teams for everything that you've done and continue to do to care for Iowans during this time. I also know that you are both very busy because there is a lot going on. So I don't wanna keep you uh, from where you needed to need to be. So we're gonna let you guys get back to work. But again, thank you for helping us share the message and helping um, really talk to Iowans about the role that our hospital systems and, uh, and clinics play across the state of Iowa. So thank you for being here. I appreciate it very much. So over the last few weeks, my uh, work as governor has taken me across the state. And what I've had the chance to, where I've had the chance to talk with Iowans from all walks of life about the struggles that they've endured the last nine months, I've heard from business owners who are finally starting to make a comeback and have indicated they can't afford another shutdown. Families who, for the first time, received assistance from the state or their local communities when they couldn't make ends meet because they lost their jobs. Parents who are grateful to finally have their children back in school where they're flourishing again, not only academically, but socially and emotionally. And I spoke with a number of people who shared personal stories about their experience of having COVID-19. These stories and those of countless others are why it's so important that every Iowan does their part to stop the spread of COVID-19. So again, so we can keep our Main Street businesses open, so we can keep our kids in school and get more Iowans back to work. So we can do everything that we can to protect our most vulnerable and our healthcare workforce and make sure that our hospitals remain stable. I need every Iowan doing their part to be part of the solution. So I'm going uh, to do my part to ensure that Iowa gets the message. Uh, next week, we are launching a public awareness campaign that we'll be rolling out in newspapers across the state and then on radio and on TV to remind Iowans to step up and stop the spread by practicing public health measures that will help us get life back to normal. Additionally, um, so that'll launch next week. Additionally, we'll be making sure that testing continues to be accessible. Uh, yesterday, we announced that test Iowa sites in Lynn and Blackhawk counties be, will be relocated over the weekend to enclosed buildings that will allow drive-through testing to continue throughout the winter months. Uh, the Lynn County site will remain in Cedar Rapids, but move from the DOT District 6 office to Windstar Lanes on Willow Creek Drive. The, Block, the Blackhawk County site, currently at Crossroads Mall in Waterloo, will move to a nearby industrial building at Alex Alexander Drive. Um, addresses for all the sites can be found at coronavirus.iowa.gov. Plans to, trans, um, to transition the remaining drive-through sites in Pottawatomie County are also underway. Additionally, the second testing site in Des Moines at Polk County River Place will close when testing concludes on Friday. And going forward, the metro area and surrounding communities will be served from a single location on Northeast 3rd Street in Des Moines, which is enclosed for winter and can accommodate the testing volumes uh, on the, uh, of, the, of the two sites. And next week, the state operated test Iowa sites and the state hygienic lab will be closed uh, in observance of Veterans Day. So we want Iowans to be sure and, and, and uh, know that. The test sites will close early at noon on Tuesday, November 10th. So samples taken that day can be transported to the lab and processed ahead of the holiday uh, on Wednesday. And so with that, we will go ahead and open it up for questions. Governor, you for months have been telling Iowans to do the right thing. Yep. You've been on TV telling Iowans to do the right thing. How is the public awareness campaign saying that same message at this moment when things haven't gotten better 
going to change any behavior. Yeah. So, Caroline, what I think is happening right now, and we're seeing that happen across the country, so it's not just in Iowa. As the news reports every single day, record cases across this country in every single state, record hospitalizations in every state across this country, what is honestly happening is people are just experiencing pandemic fatigue. They are wearing down and wearing out, and they want to get their lives back to normal. And so I am going to double down, and I am asking them to double down, and we're going to do that. I've been doing targeted radio hits. I've been speaking with media all over the state. I've been talking to Iowans, and we're going to double down on that with an extensive media outreach in local newspapers that they read, in radio stations that they listen to every day, and in the local media that they watch, just reminding them that it's not over, that we're getting ready to move uh, into colder weather, which means more indoor gatherings. And we need to get ahead of that, and we need to double down. And I want to tell you, too, as I traveled across the state, the number two thing, the, the two most things that I heard the most often, the things that I heard the most often was, please keep my kids in school and keep my business open. You know, we, it's important that, that we're able to do that. And so I'm going to, we're going to really make an extensive effort to remind people that they can help us do that. They can be a part of the solution, and really it is, to the doctor's point, it's who we are as Iowans. We band together, we've done that in crisis after crisis, in disaster after disaster, and this is no different. So help us bring these numbers down, help us flatten that curve, help us get ready to move into the winter months and really be conscientious of your gatherings and what you're doing and go online and look at what the numbers are in your area. Um, think about, you know, my mom is very vulnerable. She fits into that category. She's had significant heart issues, and I am very conscientious uh, if I'm around her to, to make sure that we're all, the family's doing the right thing. So think about, you know, the loved ones that you can be pr protecting by making the right choices. Right. David? So, since you're saying the nation is involved in all this, it's certainly true, but Iowa is second in the nation now with, with this level of spread. So I'm wondering if, if, you, if you feel that you have any responsibility over the last month or so as you've been campaigning and working hard yeah. on the islands, yeah. but you haven't imposed any new mitigation measures or done anything to really slow the curve, just leaving it to islands to do it. No. It hasn't worked. No, well, no, I just explained very, you know, very, you know, quite a few reasons why I think this is happening. And we're not alone, and the Midwest is just getting hit. We've seen it move across the country. I think you've all watched the various maps that have shown how the virus moves, and it is definitely moving. It was over on the East Coast, then it moved down to Florida, then it moved south, then it moved to Texas. Now it's in the Midwest. And so, you know, um, I have continued to, to talk to Iowans about what they need to do. We continue to look at mitigation efforts when our kids went back to school. We took a look at what the case investigations were telling us. They were saying that they were gathering in, in bars. We knew the spikes were attributed during that to 18 to 24-year-olds, and so we made, made uh, necessary adjustments. We drove that down. I continue to, as we just demonstrated up here, unprecedented collaboration with our healthcare systems. I cannot say enough about how grateful I am to them and what I've seen uh, over the last, really throughout the whole pandemic. We didn't even have a process in place to really understand the number of ICU beds, surge beds, and vents that we had. There was no system in place to monitor that. In a relatively short time, because of the collaboration of our healthcare systems, we know that. Now, with the collaboration of our healthcare systems working to collectively, you know, these, this was Mercy and Unity Point standing up here, kind of competitors working together to make sure that they're taking care of Iowans, to making sure that we understand their surge plans, the number of beds. In fact, in central Iowa, with their surge capacity, uh, they can increase from their current bed capacity today 150 percent, but it comes down to workforce. And that's why, again, we need, Iowans need to do what we can do to make sure that we keep people healthy, we keep our health care workers healthy, our educators healthy, so that we can uh, meet the needs of not only individuals with COVID-19, but also just other individuals that need to utilize our hospitals uh, across this across the state. So we're working together. We're going to get out there and remind Iowans that while you're tired of it and you're just you're wanting you want it to be over, it's not. It's not over yet. And until we have a vaccine, we're going to you know every day we're learning more. They're getting better at treating 
uh, individuals with COVID-19, and we're going to continue to see that advance, I believe, in the next month. But until then, I am asking Iowans, personally, I'm asking Iowans to double down, get out there, help me, help your fellow Iowan, uh, do these very simple things that we've asked you to do, and then let's watch it. Let's let's see how it can be effective, and let's let's together uh, help get those numbers down, stabilize it, bend the curve, and really get ready uh, for the winter. Governor, what happens when test Iowa supplies run out, and do you know when that will be, and what is going to replace that? Yeah. So every day we have more and more test um, options coming on, Kay. But the Bionix now, the antigen test, test Iowa. Uh, we still have, I'll get you the number afterwards because I don't want to misspeak, but I think we have capacity to go through November. We've been working with the uh, Dr. Pentella at the State Hygienic Lab. This is really a decision that we're really asking him to help us determine, you know, through um, various pricing and how we move forward. So Dr. Pentella has been very involved in that. Uh, in addition to that, you know, Corteva. Um, is also providing test supplies. The, the benefit of Corteva right now is it's a saliva test. And, and so there's some opportunities there if we can keep the cost low. Uh, there's a great partnership with our long-term care facilities because it's not a, as intrusive for some you know, residents that are very vulnerable. And we know that that's a population that we need to be very mindful of. And so we can use the Binex now to help test staff. We can use the PCR, which is the gold standard, to validate some of the antigen test, um, and then continue to you know look for new options to bring in. So so we'll have a supply chain. I think that's probably what you're asking me. If we'll have a supply chain there to re when we're when we've ex used all of the 540 thousand, and the answer is yes. Uh, we're working on that right now, and we have we have several different options. So. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, that's always on the table. So that's why we talk daily with our hospital systems to make sure. That's why we just allocated 25 million. This isn't a mitigation effort, but it is in reality uh, why we um, allocated 25 million to help support our workforce. Because, again, as states all across the country are seeing increased hospitalization, our healthcare workers are just a you know a, a stressed com uh, commodity, you know, for lack of a better word, and so they're seeing. Um, you know, uh, the cost to pay them to work is going up. And so to help with that, to help maintain their workforce, this is how we can help supplement that. So, but yes, so we, but we, we look at that every day. We meet in the morning, we meet in the night. Our team is working on it all the time. So we're going to take a look at seeing if this really doubling down and getting out there and talking to Iowans, reminding them to get the flu shot, reminding them to wear a mask, reminding them to stay home when they're sick, to wash your hands often is just critical. Uh, in spreading the virus. And so uh, we're going to continue to look at that. It, what we're seeing, though, is, is if you look at what other states are doing, it is just they are experiencing higher numbers. We're testing more. That's a part of it. So in my numbers, when we reflect that, it, they're deduplicated. So that's not really reflective of the number of Iowans that are being tested every day because we take the duplication, the, one, the duplicate ones out. But you're seeing more and more testing. Um, and so that's we're identifying or more, but that's good because then we can start to do the case investigation and hopefully get on top of it. Governor, in the month um, since you've held one of these regular news conferences, you've been out campaigning quite a bit. Mm -hmm. At the video from these events, as you well know, people frequently do not wear masks. Yeah. Has that led to this increased spread? And why, when you are at these events, have you never stood up there and encouraged people to wear a mask? like you are today and like you've done a gazillion times. They do. But they don't. The video there shows that no. most people do not. That's not what I was saying. I, that's not, I didn't say oh, they do. Sorry. What I was saying, well, I interrupted you. I'm sorry for that, too. I, didn't, I should have let you finish your statement, um, a question. But um, so, so they, anybody that goes, they tell them this is the protocol. They hand out masks. They take the temperature. They encourage it. So that is being done at every aspect. Uh, it's no, but, at, but it doesn't, people aren't doing it. Yeah, but, you know, the, the, we can't prohibit First Amendment rights. People that are peacefully out there gathering and protesting, wherever it may be, not everybody is wearing a mask. So we're going to continue to talk about the importance of doing that. They're holding them outdoors. They're taking temps. They're handing out masks. 
you know, trying to again reiterate the importance. But David, Dave, it's a balance, and I do have to say that it is just a balance. People, you know, they're they're concerned. We are seeing substance abuse increase. We are seeing um, behavioral health issues increase. We're seeing people delayed delay their care. So I have to figure out a way to balance through all of that. And that's why we're going to just double down. We're going to get out there and just continue to drive home the simple things that Iowans can do uh, to help mitigate and to help really bring down the numbers. So I guess my point is that there, unfortunately, is a pretty strong, it feels like, party divide on like masks. We've, you've been asking oh, I don't think so. I mean, I wouldn't say because you've got governors across the board, Republican and Democrat, that have done masks. At a campaign event, Democrats wear them, Republicans well, I don't know if that's fair because, Dave, they do. I had one on. You can see that. I saw a lot of people in masks uh, when I was there, too. I had, you know, had mine on. I'd take it off to speak. I'd take it off sometimes to take a picture and put it back on. It was less than two minutes. But, you know, I've tried to lead by example. They've tried to hold the events outside because they know that it's better to be outdoors and that that was important. Um, but I also think that Iowa said in this election they want to get through it. They want to figure out a way to move on. They they, you know, agree with how we've handled COVID-19. I, I just, I believe that's what the election said. They, you know, we tried to be careful getting out there, talking to Iowans, talking about what's important, talking about what's at stake. You know, it was a critically important election. And, you know, we, we did it, tried to do it in a safe and responsible manner. But I, I think the election reflects that Iowans somewhat agree with how we have handled uh, not only COVID-19, but conservative, conservative fiscally uh, responsible decisions that have been made. We are one of the few states that have a balanced budget, that have our cash reserves full, and have a surplus. And that is going to make a difference in the livelihood of Iowans as we move forward. It just is. There's not a lot of other states that are in that same, uh, they're in that same spot. And uh, we want to get our lives back to normal. We want to do it in a safe and responsible way, and we're going to continue to do everything we can to make that happen. So we're, 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 we'll go into our national public health experts, and right now there are facts that, you know, public health experts say should be taken mm -hmm. to slow the spread. Mm -hmm. One of the top cases from the spread of COVID-19. Um, and there are things that, you know, you don't necessarily have to shut down businesses, so like requiring masks, mm -hmm. um, limit on um, social gatherings in terms of numbers of people. I mean, why not take any of those? Well, we're looking at it, and I look at it every day, and we have made adjustments. But I'll give you an example. We just had the healthcare, um, two healthcare systems represented up here. Earlier on, we uh, we had them hold a certain number of beds and eliminated elective procedures. As I talked to the CEO of Genesis, as I talked to the CEO of our different varying healthcare systems, I talked to Shares with the University of Iowa healthcare system. They are saying this is what we do every day. Give us the opportunity to. Uh, operate we will adjust and they are adjusting and doing the things that they need to do and you can look across the board there are different states that have implemented different things different measures and we're all seeing pretty much the same results so we're going to go out there we're going to continue to look i'm telling people when we do the case investigation right now it is coming down to gatherings to small small groups just small groups so think about it i'm asking iowans to think about it Take precautions when we're getting together. Think about who can be impacted um, uh, by not doing those simple measures that we talk about. Again, stay home when you're sick, wash your hands, wear a mask, socially distance, get a flu shot. We get out there and we do those simple things, we're going to start to see a difference. Thank you. Uh, well, I, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're still working on that, Kay. It's something I'm, con uh, you know, very interested in right now, or have to continue to be interested in. So we're continuing to look at the numbers to see what's possible. So now that we've got through the election, we're gonna start down like we would this time of year anyway, and start working on our program and and the budget for the next legislative sessions session, and that will be a part of what we look at. Will Thank you. What? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we hear workforce, childcare, housing. Our businesses are continuing to grow. I've had, I have had businesses fearful of being shut down again, and I have businesses that have told me that their um, numbers actually exceed where they were a year ago. But again, it is workforce, and it is childcare, and it is housing, and broadband is something else that we're going to continue 
uh, to work on, because especially as we work through the pandemic, we need to make sure that we can provide telehealth, that we can telelearn, and that we can have um, business or employees work from home when they need to. Thank you.